Chris with Cowdog here, and today we are going to be making a recreation of the George Nakashima Kanoe table, utilizing a traditional Japanese timber frame joint with a twist. For those not familiar with his work, George Nakashima. Nakashima. I'm not going to work here anymore anyway. <laughs> was an American-born Japanese architect, furniture designer, and woodworker. He is the godfather of the modern live-edge slab table, and his Conoid series is one of the most influential and striking furniture designs of the 20th century. For more information on George and his work, I strongly recommend reading his book, The Soul of a Tree, which I'll have linked in the description below. While a lot of George's furniture appears to center around walnut as the wood species, I've opted to go with what I have accessible, which is mahogany. The base will be crafted from 8 quarter mahogany, whereas the top will be a slab of locally sourced Cuban mahogany from my friend PJ Fetcher. To keep all my components consistent, I utilize a small stop block against the fence to make sure that I have consistent length and to prevent binding between the fence and the blade. While aesthetically similar, the base I've designed has some stark differences from the original conoid. The original conoid used a rabbited bridle joint of sorts along the base runner. However, since I'm into over-engineering my work for the most part, I've decided to use Ari Shiguchi, a structural Japanese timber frame joint, mounted into a bridle joint to create a rigid base to support the heavier slab top. Based on the angular design, this will have to be done at 10 degrees, which makes an already tricky joint just a bit trickier. Starting with the bridle joint, which will inevitably house the mortise, all the measurements are simply referenced off the corresponding piece. For a bridle joint, I like to divide the thickness by equal thirds to maintain structural integrity, with the mortise being the outer two thirds and the tenon being the middle third. Just to give you guys a little bit of context in this sawing technique, what I'm doing here is I'm actually approaching at it from about a 45-ish degree angle. I'm going to cut until about halfway through and I reach this baseline over here. Then once I do that, I'm gonna flip this and actually approach from a similar angle of attack. Same thing, getting to my baseline, which will then give me about a pyramid's worth of material to remove. At that time, I'll saw straight down, matching the kerf lines to be able to get plumb. If you're liking this video so far, don't forget to hit that like button, comment on the video below, and subscribe to the channel. Also, you can follow me on social media. Instagram is my social media of choice, at Cowdog Craftworks. To clear the waste from the mortise, I'm using a half-inch mortise chisel. Mortise chisels are heftier for a multitude of reasons, namely to resist twisting and bending, with its stoutness able to hold an edge longer during more aggressive tasks. This mortise chisel is the Veritas chisel in PMV11 steel, and much like all the PMV11 offerings, holds an edge well and sharpens easily. I'll start from one side, flip, work the other, and then knock out the middle before trimming with a bench chisel to final dimension. If you're not using squared stock as a guide fence, you are really missing out. Utilizing squared stock as a reference fence is a great way to ensure that your components are flat, square, and that everything seats properly. Alternatively, for the inside third tenon of the bridle joint, I'll clear out some of the waste on the table saw. I was feeling a bit lazy as far as putting on the dado stack, so I just stuck with the standard combo blade. A dado stack would be more efficient, but since I'm refining everything with hand tools, a little extra elbow grease to knock everything out seemed fitting enough. I'll rough out a bulk of the waste with the chisel beveled down, which makes quicker work of this, and then use a router plane along with a jack plane to give me a flat interior face for the joint. Using the router plane is a bit of a hack since I don't have a rabbiting block plane that can get right up to the shoulder, so the router plane will remove the material and give me a parallel surface to the face, then the jack plane can come in and flatten the surface to that router plane to groove. Yeah. 
I get a lot of questions about why I'm dampening the wood prior to chiseling. For the most part, I'm using denatured alcohol to soften the grain to make for better pairing. However, I did notice that with this mahogany in particular, good old fashioned water was actually giving me better results. The only caution I have is to test whatever liquid softening agent you're using on some scrap because certain woods can stain. This video is brought to you in part by the Home Depot Perspective Program. The Home Depot was kind enough to select me for this program and send me out two rigid shop vacs and a filter set to utilize in the shop. While a shop vac is a bit of a silent partner in any shop, these vacs proved to be useful in keeping my workspace clean between joinery tasks, and the cordless shop vac was a great alternative to more expensive dust collection for my track saw and domino. To put it cleanly, these vacuums suck, but in a good way. I'll have all the affiliate links for these tools as well as a number of the other tools I use listed in the description below. As the entire base splays out at 10 degrees, both the tops and bottoms of these leg assemblies have been cut to match. Then the joinery is laid out on both the upper stretcher and the bridle joint on each of the legs. To be sure I'm staying on the good side of my layout lines, I'm very careful with the sawing and really only taking small bites at it from every plausible angle in an effort to be able to correct any potential drift. This is essentially the saw technique described earlier but on a micro level, and I'm alternating between my dovetail saw which has a rip tooth configuration and my bench top saw which while more versatile, cross cuts more cleanly. Everything is ultimately pared down to my layout lines and then the back of the dovetail is chamfered to make the dry fit and final fit for that matter a bit smoother and prevent damage to the dovetail itself. The Ari Shiguchi mortise is started with a number of relief cuts that'll make the bulking out of waste a fair bit easier. I'm starting at this halfway point in an effort to find the base of the dovetail which rests exactly halfway into the mortise since the shoulders will be recessed into the joint to prevent twisting and racking. One of the nice things about this joint is that it thrives on downward force so as there's more pressure applied this joint is actually becoming more solid. Using the other leg assembly as an angle guide, I'm able to ensure that both the base of the dovetail and the base of the joint itself are finished to the correct corresponding angle. This takes the guesswork of using an angle finder, bevel gauge, or anything like that out of the equation, and any imperfections in the angle that were a result of the track saw will just be transferred to here as well, ensuring everything is consistent. The conoids trestle base has a dual angular design to these leg assemblies and that will be marked out and then cut with a plunge cut on the track saw and finished with a handsaw. This is a very similar technique to what I used on the timber frame barn door, just done on a much smaller scale. I'll have that video linked up in the corner if you're interested. To clean up the edges of the leg assembly, I'm going to use a jack plane and then a card scraper which will help work the transition between the two angles. One thing to watch out for here is that the two angles cut into the board will change the way the grain direction runs on the edge grain, so just take a little bit of time to feel and map that out before just getting after it. The 
joinery for the bottom of the base is quite basic in comparison. I'll be utilizing a half lap and bridle joint pegged from both sides. As I said before, the original conoid does not have the stretcher above and instead utilized a more structural base joint here, a rabbited bridle joint to the best of my understanding. However, since I've made the very solid structural upper stretcher, these joints can be a bit more plug and play. Having a little more room to work with as far as bulking out the bridle joint, I'll saw my vertical lines and then cut in an X pattern across the waist. This ultimately will leave me with far less waist to clear out, and once again I'll use the mortise chisel to clear out that pyramid's worth of material. Currently my 604 bedrock is undergoing a full-blown restoration, so I have my low-angle jack plane from Veritas dialed in as a smoother, with the mouth of the plane as tight as I can get it, and the iron super duper sharp. I'm going for a little embellishment detail here on the foot component so to speak, so I'll use a spoke shave and at times the low angle block to bevel all the upper corners on the feet. And then the major components of the base are glued up and assembled. Chamfering the entry point for your dowel stock is vital to using a dowel plate, and I'll make some dowels to peg the bridle joints from both sides. Part of the idea of going from both sides instead of all the way through is to minimize the risk of any blowout on the back side, even using a sacrificial board. To clear the waist in the half lap, or third lap rather since it'll be two thirds width in this board and one third in the other, I went a little more aggressive than I did before with the combo blade and was able to crunch most of the waist out with a little bit of finger blasting. Since the major components of the base are already glued up, I'll have to saw the corresponding mortise right into my assembled base, which leaves very little room for error. You'll also likely notice here that the bridle joint in this shot is only pegged from one side, and that's because the double peg was an after the fact call I made after this process since I wasn't confident that the joint would resist lateral racking. You know, it's better to be a belt and suspenders guy than to be caught with your pants down. Since I'm working out of a one car garage, prior to applying finish I prefer to go ahead and do a quick once over cleaning. I utilize a lot of wiping finishes and dust, debris, and all that nonsense can cause rough or cloudy finishes, so a clean workshop is an absolute must. Also, the car cleaning kit for this shop back is a bit of an unsung hero, 
the soft bristle angle tool helps get all the surface dust off the workpiece before wiping it down with mineral spirits, which then ensures better oil penetration. For finish on the base, I'm using Real Milk Paint Company's Hemp Oil, a polymerizing natural oil. It's a wipe on wipe off application and I'll do multiple coats over a few days to create a durable finish for this base. If you're interested in trying it out or any of the Real Milk Paint Company's products, check out their website and use coupon code COWDOGCRAFTWORKS for 10% off. Onto the tabletop, I've got two sequential slabs that when arranged in a folded out manner will be book matched. These are slabs of Cuban mahogany which will be a bit lighter than the base but will create some subtle contrast. To cut them to fit, I'll overlap them to get total width, mark, and then use the track saw to rip the top slab and at the same time score a line in the bottom slab. Then I'll line up to that score line with the track and complete the cut. Since I don't have a jointer in my shop, I use a jointer plane, and here I'll use the number 8 to joint the seam while the slabs are book matched to create two congruent pieces that will be joined together. Then the domino will help bring everything together and keep my slabs aligned. Out the clamps, I'll trim the ends perpendicular to the center line, and that cut will be made at 10 degrees as well, and then I'll start flattening everything by hand. To clean up the live edges, I'm going with a wire brush drill attachment and a sander. To clean off the burn marks on the end grain, I'll use the low angle jack. Then a chamfer is added all around, utilizing a low angle block plane and a spoke shave. To finish the tabletop, I'm going with Real Milk Paint Company's Pure Tongue Oil. Pure Tongue Oil, as opposed to Big Box Store Tongue Oil, is a completely food safe product, and it is also one of the few oil only products that, when layered, will create a truly waterproof barrier. I'll apply about 10 to 12 coats over a span of 3 to 4 days, and then give it a few extra days to create a full cure. Warmer temps and climates will create a faster cure time. Thin coats seem to work best, and it creates an amazing sheen. Z-clips will attach the tabletop to the base and I'll cut the slots for it with the domino. Z-clips in this application are great for allowing wood movement in the top and they're extremely low profile. And we're done. The genius of George Nakashima's work is in its simplicity and ability to let the tree speak for itself. While this isn't a dead-on replica of a conoid table, George Nakashima was originally an architect by trade, and I truly believe he would appreciate the intricate Ari Shiguchi joint which gives this base its structural integrity. As an Asian American myself, George's work speaks to me in a reflective way. It's both traditional and disciplined, yet raw and unorthodox. It's a paradox in the most fun way. I encourage everyone to read The Soul of a Tree and the complete Japanese joinery which I have linked in the description below and draw inspiration from George's work and the beauty of trees. This craft will be all the better for it. Alright guys, that's it for me on this one. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe. Check out some of the affiliate links and the tools listed below in the description. I'll also have an article up on my website as well as instructables.com. Once again, thanks for watching and see you next time here at Cowdog Craftworks.
for my semi-episodic bourbon review. Today I'm going to be featuring Michter's Small Batch US1, a 91.4 proof bourbon, very caramel forward, little bit of rye notes, not as spicy as a typical Kentucky bourbon, but absolutely delicious. Cheers. Okay.